and welcome to episode 36 of Foreign Correspondence, a podcast that brings you interviews with journalists around the world. I'm Jake Spring, a foreign correspondent with nine years experience in Brazil and China. It's only a couple of weeks to go until the U.S. presidential election, and I wanted to bring you an interview that touches on how journalists are covering the election. So for this episode, I spoke to Libby Nelson, Senior Deputy Policy Editor for the news website Fox. Libby and I went to college together at Northwestern University, where we were both class of 2009 and lived in the same dorm, the Communications Residential College, for the first two years. We both worked at the student newspaper, The Daily Northwestern, where she was editor-in-chief and brought me on as the opinion page editor for one of the quarters. Libby was about as straight-laced as they come, as we'll discuss, and seemed destined for a career as a hard news reporter at a newspaper. She was the person you measured yourself against. I mean, after all, she got the covetous lot as a New York Times intern. I don't think many people would have tipped her to end up working at startups. But as we've discussed frequently on this podcast, your idea of how your career might be in your early 20s often doesn't pan out and may not even end up being what you really want. Libby will talk about how she went from being a newspaper reporter in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to working for a series of startups. Libby joined Vox when it was only an idea prior to its launch and had only a couple dozen employees. She worked her way up to her current job as senior deputy policy editor, where she gets to think critically about the questions the public has about policies that affect their lives, then gets to direct reporters to answering those questions, and shapes the final articles. We'll get into how this particular election is not particularly substantive. Let's just say policy specifics aren't going to swing this one. And how it has made sense to keep focus on coronavirus and the economy rather than shifting solely to the election. I'm getting into spoiler territory, so I'll stop there. I'll just end by saying to my American listeners to go out and vote on November 3rd. It's an important one. I've already voted by mail, and I live in Brazil, so you have no excuse. And now, without further ado... Here's my interview with Libby Nelson, Senior Deputy Policy Editor at Vox. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. If you could set the scene, if you could give us a sense of where you are, both physically and geographically, what time it is, and also tell us a little bit about what your past week of work has been like. Yeah, so I am in Washington, D.C. I am sitting under a blanket in my bedroom, which has also been my office for the last six and a half months. Um, It is 5.30 p.m. here, and my workday yesterday ended at 12.30 in the morning because of the first presidential debate. So that's about how my (laughs) week has been so far. Sure. Uh, How does something like that go for you as the the senior editor? Were you on it or were you editing the copy or how were you involved? Yeah. So normally on a night like this, the whole policy and politics team at Vox and most of the foreign team and a few other reporting teams as well would all be in the office together. Obviously, that hasn't happened in a while. So we were all on Slack and in our own living rooms. We're all sort of watching together, chatting about our observations. We have a plan going in that we're there to execute on, but there's also sort of a lot of pivoting in the moment. And so I'm editing copy as it comes in, making sure people are on assignments as things happen, and then already sort of starting to think about the next day and what we think people are going to want to read and what we're well equipped to explain to them and where we need to be in terms of assignments. Cool. And yeah, I'm actually honestly surprised you said it ended at 1230 and not much later. I mean, I saw it. It was kind of a mess. (laughs) Uh, I'm surprised you didn't have to. Oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't have to pull an all-nighter or something, but interesting. And I mean, I guess, how how long have you been in election mode, would you say? Oh, my gosh. So this year is obviously weird. Normally, in an election year, it would be a lot of the year. I would say I started this year very much in election mode. We had a lot of ideas around the primaries. We got through March. The nomination was decided almost at the same time the pandemic hit the U.S. And I've been mostly in COVID mode ever since then. So even now, I'm like preparing for the big moments like the debate. But from a policy perspective, it feels to me like the most important work we can do is to keep writing about the pandemic and to keep writing about the economy. So I've definitely had sort of a split attention span all year long. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. I guess we'll talk a little bit more about your job when we get to that point in the chronology 
the first section is biographical and we like to start way, way back at the beginning and figure out how you got to where you are now. And we start at the very beginning with where were you born? And if you could tell me a little bit about what growing up was like, and if you started to show any interest in journalism early on. Yeah, this is a fun one for me, actually. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. I grew up in the Kansas suburbs of Kansas City. My parents met at the Kansas City Star, which was our hometown newspaper. So I, to a degree, sort of grew up in the newsroom. I was in there with my dad at work every so often. I was always around journalism. I was always around this idea that, like, news could happen and you could have a plan and and then news could happen and your entire plan would change. And I was always interested in reading and writing. And my parents really pushed journalism as like a way to pay the bills rather than being a novelist when I was, you know, 10 or 11. So it's definitely like, it's not that I never had a choice, but it was definitely a world I was like very much born into. Right. And yeah, I remembered you came from a journalist family. <laughs> do you do you have brothers and sisters? And did I, any of them go into journalism? Yes, I have one sister. My sister, Laura, is a transportation reporter at the Los Angeles Times, where she's worked since 2012. So we are four for four journalism degrees and journalism careers in my family. Wow, that's pretty amazing. It's horrifying, honestly. My mom is always like, there's this family of dentists in our neighborhood, and they're all dentists. And isn't that funny? And I'm like, that's that's exactly like our family. I don't know why you think this is strange. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's way better than like four accountants or dentists or something like that. The Kansas City Star, you said, is that right? Mm -hmm. I imagine this was in kind of the heyday of newspapers still. I mean, I feel like I missed any of that, but you must have seen a little bit of it as a kid. Would you say that? I saw a little bit of it. I didn't see enough of it to understand it because my dad was an editor and he was a assistant managing editor for most of my life. And so to me, his career was like he went to the office and he had meetings. And being an editor and having a career where I go to the office and have meetings, I now understand it. But it's not like he was out there like flying around the country and staying in hotels and having an expense account. But we had a really nice middle class, upper middle class life. And that was very achievable at that point in newspaper history in America in a way that it just doesn't feel anymore that you could have a good, nice career in a mid-sized local paper and support your family and send your kids to college and all of that. Like the, the level of stability that he had in his career is something that has never felt like a realistic possibility for me. Right. Yeah. Did your parents leave before things went down the tubes or did they stick around? For Pretty much. So my dad, uh, my mom, my mom quit working when my sister was born. I mean, she freelanced part-time, but was not full-time in the office after that. So her career was a little different. My dad left the Kansas City Star in 2008 and went to be the editor-in-chief of the Lincoln, Nebraska Journal Star, uh, which is the local paper there. And he retired from there in 2012. So he definitely saw things start to get pretty bad. He retired kind of suddenly amid a dispute about the budget and how much cutting he was or wasn't willing to do. So he got pretty lucky in that if he had stayed at the Star he probably would have had to lay off a lot of people and then he would have been laid off himself. Like it's, it's really hard to imagine that going any other way. And he said that, but having a journalism career from 1976 to 2012, it's very different from 2009 to present. Right. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Where are you folks now? I have some family in Lincoln, Nebraska, so I've oh, been there. Yeah, they're, they're still there. They actually really love it. It, my dad was there about three or four years before he retired and, I remember asking if he was sorry they'd totally moved because it, it took them a while to sell their house and like totally make the decision to pick up and leave. Kansas City isn't that far away, but they really love it. They have a fun neighborhood that's like college professors and state workers and academics and journalists, and they're really, really happy there. They're both from Nebraska originally, so this wasn't a, a totally random move. Okay, gotcha. Cool. And did they try to warn you off of journalism at all, or did they encourage you to go into it? Um, Both. When it was like, oh, well, this is a, a more stable writing career than just like being a writer, which is what I thought I wanted to do when I was 13. You know, that was one thing. I think as it got clearer that things were bad, there was a little bit more like, OK, you know, think about this. But I think about having two parents who do the same thing as you is like you're not exposed to that many other jobs that you can do. And so there was never a like do this instead from them. 
Right. So did you do the kind of path I think a lot of people at Northwestern did where you got a newspaper in high school and that started you down your road? Or Yeah, uh, and it, it absolutely like? did. Yeah, if my parents could have like encouraged me to go into journalism all they wanted, but if I had not done newspaper in high school, I don't think that I would have. I had just an incredible journalism teacher who frankly taught me more than I ever learned in college named Dow Tate. And he was probably like the single biggest influence on me in terms of actually like pursuing journalism and becoming a journalist. And so much of what he taught me, I still use even as an editor. So that was really like the turning point in my career, which is crazy to say I was like 15 and didn't even have a career, <laughs> but that was like very much the turning point of my life. Huh. What was it? Was he an ex-journalist or what, what was so great about it? He really was a professional teacher. He'd trained as a journalist and worked as a journalist for a few years, but he'd been teaching for about 20 years. And he actually had an idea of how to teach people to report and write. It was like very intensive editing, but also like you practiced interviewing. He would like game plan stuff like that out with you. And he gave us a lot of responsibility and treated us like professionals. And the work that high school kids can do is really astonishing, I think, in a, a case like that. And I'm still in touch with him. The day that my sister was cited, uh, my sister also took his class. She was cited as part of a Pulitzer at the LA Times four or five years ago. He called her and then he called me to be like, are you okay with your sister having won a Pulitzer before you? Um, he's really one of those teachers who like cares a lot about their students and tracks them through their careers. That's nice. Wow. Yeah. And... From there, did you apply to all journalism schools? Was Northwestern kind of the one, or, or how did you find your way there? Yeah, my college search was insane. North, I knew I wanted to be a journalist, and I applied to like two out of seven or eight schools I applied to were journalism schools. And so Northwestern was like pretty much the one very early. I didn't give myself a ton of realistic other options. I think I thought like, oh, I'll do the student paper, and maybe I'll go to grad school. But much to my parents' dismay, because it was definitely the most expensive place I applied, it was really the only place that I thought I wanted to go. Right. I, I mean, I guess there's a big debate about whether people should go to journalism school, whether it's worthwhile, whether it's something you should just learn on the job. And I've interviewed a few other people who went to Northwestern, and I usually ask, I mean, do you think it was worth it? I mean, what, what did you make of four years in Medill? Oh, my gosh, this is such a hard question. <laughs> I can answer the, like, is journalism school a necessary question a lot more easily. I don't think it's necessary. I actually don't even think that it's really a good idea for a lot of reasons that I can get to in a second. Sure. But, you know, I think it was worth it for me. I'm still friends with so many people who I met in CRC, like in our dorm, like the first week of school. It's one of those things where it's somewhat hard to imagine my career without it, but it's also really hard to imagine the alternate version of my life where I didn't go to Northwestern. And so it's really hard for me to say, like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. When a lot of things I have in my life, I either got through people I met at school or, or linked in some way to my time there. But at the same time, I don't know. I very much fall on the, like, journalism school is kind of a scam. And you should probably, like, major in something and learn something about something as opposed to, like, trying to learn to be a reporter, which a lot of journalism schools don't even teach particularly well. I feel like a lot of people our year and around us, if you were really like a top journalism student like Striver, many of them had very antagonistic relationships with the actual journalism school, which I always found kind of interesting. I mean, it was this time of flux, right, where there was a lot of uncertainty in the industry. And I feel like, I mean, I only took three classes in the journalism school, but they were not quite sure what they were supposed to be teaching to. So it kind of turned it into a bit of a mess in our era. And I feel like they were still trying to teach us to this kind of local newspaper standard that didn't exist, like in the 101 class and things like that. I was just going to say, I imagine your issues are with the like the curriculum itself, like the stuff around it, the people, the Daily Northwest. Yeah, it was all good. Yeah, exactly. I'd actually completely forgotten that you you, you do not have a middle degree. That's crazy. Which I think <laughs> like kind of proves the point, right? Like there's the whole infrastructure set up, and at the on the one hand, it's hard to imagine all of the ancillary stuff without a journalism school to revolve around, but I mean the example I always use, and it's gotten less and less potent because I tell this to like our current interns who are often middle students and who have no idea what I'm talking about. But I took a whole class on how to use Adobe Flash 
And <laughs> while I was in that class, learning to build multimedia graphics for Flash, which if you, you know, were not in college in 2007, was the way to build interactive graphics on the internet at that time. I think the iPhone came out while I was in that class and it doesn't support Flash. And within two years, like this was completely obsolete. And if you look at the per class price, that was like, I don't know, $10,000, $11,000. And Eesh. it felt like on the one hand, Magill was very responsible about grappling with this idea that the media is changing and people are going to need new skills. But they didn't really know what skills we would need. And so there was a lot of focus on teaching us technical stuff that was outdated almost immediately. And then on the other hand, like, as you said, it was very, you're going to be in this world where you work at a small newspaper and then a medium sized newspaper and then a bigger newspaper. And like, that's your career. And we're going to teach you the very narrow skill set you need to do that work. Right. I mean, I remember the impression I got from taking the one-on-one class and stuff was that, for example, you should never speak to people off the record. They practically taught us that in that class. I feel like you shouldn't talk to people off the record and you definitely shouldn't cite them off the record. Force people to always be on the record at all times, blah, blah, blah. And yes. like, it's so disconnected from my current job now where it took me a while to learn, like, you must talk to people off the record to get them comfortable enough. And even if you don't quote them off the record, this is kind of the way you get good information is you get people comfortable with you and maybe then they'll tell you better stuff, at least in my experience. But yeah, that's just one example of where it was like, it seemed like they took kind of a hard line on some of these ethical things that... I don't know if it really spoke to a lot of how the industry works, at least yeah, the industry it's, like, that it's survived. So removed. Yeah, like even at the time, it's so removed from the day-to-day -day reporting. Like that is such a good point. Like I had no idea how to cover a beat and that like you have to create these relationships with people and go out for coffee and occasionally tell them something and they'll tell you something and then you ask if you can use it. The whole universe of how you cultivate sources and actually become a good reporter which is totally for it. It's like, oh, you're going to be dropped into a situation you know nothing about. And your job is to find four people who will give you a quote on the record and quote them accurately and spell their names right. And that's all there is. Yeah. So I should say this is where we met. We met at the Communications Residential College, which was basically a bunch of journalists and film majors and random hangers on like myself. And we both worked at the Daily Northwestern, and I was the opinion editor when you were the editor-in-chief, which was a great experience, definitely like something that sticks with me to this day, and also learned a lot of reporting on it. But you kind of went all the way. I mean, you were editor-in-chief. What do you think about that experience now that you've got some remove from it? Oh, man. I would say a useful thing. This is going to sound more negative than I mean. I've actually come to terms with a lot of it. But a good thing to learn as a journalist is to learn when you're 22 what it feels like to burn out hard. And <laughs> I think I had two good quarters and one quarter. I mean, you know, at the time, I think I was the last editor who had to do this for a full calendar year, I think, because they saw me and were like, nope, absolutely not. That was like a 60 hour a week job, 70 hour a week job. And I was theoretically in school. Um, and none of us knew what we were doing. And we did a lot of work that I was tremendously proud of. And by the time I was done, I don't think I looked at the paper my last quarter of school because I was just so done. I guess it's good training in the sense that it's, you can really give everything to this job till you have nothing left, which sounds like super negative about a place where I made incredible friends, like learned a ton, did a lot of work I was really proud of. But like, yeah, being the editor in chief of a five day a week college newspaper, it's, it's a full time job. Um, and my grades definitely reflected that it was a full time job, which I don't regret at all. Whether I would do it again, that is really the question I ask is like, would I, would I do that part of it again, knowing what I know now? Because it was just so completely intense and consuming and long, like a, a full year when you're 21 is a long time to have your entire life be the four walls of that at the time, gorgeous and beautiful office. Right, right. And like, have you been back to campus? Like, our view was insane. Um, I, I was back for homecoming. And I just looked out the windows and was like, I can't believe I looked at Lake Michigan, like at sunset every single day for three years. Yeah, I have been back to campus. I had a kind of a bad experience going back to campus. And I, I think I left and I said to myself, I'm never coming back here, which I'll go back on at some point. I'll go back. But <laughs> I went in the dead of winter and I went to see Alec Klein. Do you remember him? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and he was somewhat of a mentor to me, and he's a very like hard on us as a class. And we'll see if I keep this in the podcast or not, but I figured I'd just share. <laughs> yeah, and he, he did a business reporting class that was very good, and he was very encouraging. And I went back to see him, and I started at Reuters. I was like a year or two in, and I expected like I'm going to go in and be like, oh, I made good. And, you know, it was looking pretty grim there in 2009 when we graduated. And I'm like, (laughs) you know, things kind of worked out. And he basically told me I was nobody unless I worked at the New York Times or had written a book. Like this was his message to me. And Oh, that sucks. Yeah. And I mean, I've talked to other people. Some people thought he was just trying to motivate me, but I just left and like, I was like, this was confusing. And I don't know. And just as an addendum to that, he's like, oh, do you want to go upstairs and meet like the people who work on the, what is that class called or the project called the Innocence Project? Oh, Um, yeah. I don't know if those employees technically work for it, if they work for Medill or what, but I go up and I meet it and it's all a bunch of very young girls. And then later, you know, we got me too and things all kind of added up. That's why I know his name. Okay. I could not figure out, I couldn't place him. That's where I know his name from. Okay. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Wow. But anyway, long aside, I guess back to Medill. So yeah, the thing about being editor-in-chief, so you do it for three quarters, it kind of goes slightly into your senior year. And this is when I go away for my junior year, I come back and the economy is tanking. It has tanked in the duration I've been gone. And I don't know, everybody was kind of freaking out. It was very hard to find jobs and internships, I felt like. So you had to do this at the Daily Northwestern and also look for what was next for you and how did you manage that and what happened next? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where I get to where I can't really say that I am sorry that I took the path I took because after graduation, I was an intern at the New York Times, which was at the time like the only goal I had in life. Um, Right. And... I actually, I don't know. This it's a weird, it's hard to do a counterfactual on this because I don't think it actually really changed the path of my career at all. It didn't really come up anywhere else I worked for a series of reasons we'll get into. I think it didn't actually turn out to be very significant. But at the same time, nobody was getting jobs, and I had this internship. And on the first day of orientation, I've told this story so many times. I think I must be making it up, but like I know it happened. <laughs> they stood up and they said. We want you all to know at the beginning, usually we try to keep on as many of our interns as we can, and we are not going to be able to do that this year. So you need to be making plans accordingly. Um, right. yeah. And so oh. I was like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not set up for life. And frankly, like, I don't think I was a great intern, and I don't know that I would have been hired even if I had stayed on. Like, It's fun to look back at this as the perspective of someone who like works with interns as opposed to having been an intern. But at the same time, like, I got to do that. And... My alternate plan was I was going to go to France and teach teach English um, and maybe try to freelance, and I never went to France. So that's kind of the two roads in a wood moment that I had there. Right. Yeah, I remember meeting you at some point, because I went to New York after college and kind of did an internship, spent all my money, moved back home, (laughs) another well-trodden path. But I remember you doing that. I mean, just what what was it like? What is it like to be a New York Times intern? I don't think I've talked to anybody who's done it. In one way, it wasn't very different from being an intern anywhere else. Like, it was the same types of assignments. It was kind of interny work. They have you on a rotation, which I actually think is maybe not a great idea, but I did, like, three weeks on the City Room blog. This was when, like, having a blog was a big thing that they were doing. Three weeks in print. And three weeks in the police bureau, which I was terrible at because like getting back to like, it's all about relationships. And I had no idea how to be a good cop reporter. Never have been super terrible at it. Consistently, one of my weaknesses throughout my career. And so you did like three weeks in each of those places. You know, I had some bylines in print, which was incredible. Had, I think, the highest number of corrections I've ever had, which (laughs) is weird. And I think I just got unlucky. An editor who I worked really closely with, who actually left a couple of years ago under kind of dubious circumstances on my last day was like, you know, everybody makes mistakes and you just made some here. And I was like, oh God, I didn't realize that I had a notable error rate. I've never had that before or since. But, you know, so I was an intern. I fucked some stuff up. I made some mistakes. I did some stuff right. But, you know, you're going into that building every day. And they were in their new building at the time that they're still in. And 
it's just really cool to be there. And I've had kind of a less traditional career after that. I've worked at a lot of startups, but having worked at the Times was like a very, very cool thing to have gotten to do, even if I knew I couldn't stay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds very cool. Just, I know that feeling of seeing your name in print and I can only imagine seeing it in the New York Times and thinking I've really made it. Although I guess you already knew you couldn't stay, but still, it, you know, maybe you're not as worried about like a lot of people were worried about not making it in journalism at all. Yeah, I mean, I still was, but that's next. Like my, I don't know if I'm going to make it year was really 2010. I went from there to another internship, which I had applied for kind of on a lark because I think I thought, oh, like, I'll probably stay at the Times or find a permanent job right away. Like this was spring 2009. I was clearly insane or out of touch or something. <laughs> this is that like, it'll be fine. I'll be fine. And I went to the Chronicle of Higher Education and got extended there. I ended up working there for nine months. But there was a moment at the end when I had applied like 45 places, like I'd applied to every job that existed. And I really thought like, you know, I was editor of the Daily Northwestern and I was a New York Times intern. Like I thought I was pretty hot stuff and I was getting nothing. And that was really my introduction to the idea that being a good intern, being a good graduating senior and being like good enough to get hired are two really different things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that was the last time we saw each other in person that you were working at the Chronicle of Higher Education. I'm not sure how far along you had gotten yet with them. Did that turn into a job or how did that go? Not in the moment, but actually that more so than the New York Times was like the experience that actually defined what I did for the next five or 10 years. I applied on a whim because a lot of kids who've been like campus reporters in college think they know how to cover higher education. And it was in D.C. I wanted to be in D.C. for personal reasons if I couldn't stay out in New York. And I thought, oh, this might be fine. And it was a really easy cover letter to write. My interview actually was like a total disaster. My phone died halfway through it. And I had to try to call from a payphone. 2009 was another um, I like bought a phone card and called them back, I think, from a payphone. And I think I was out on like a reporting assignment somewhere in New York. And I think they were impressed with my ability to solve problems I created for myself by not charging my phone. Uh, but <laughs> I covered federal higher education policy. And then I filled in for a reporter on maternity leave who covered federal higher education policy. And after another detour that we can get into in a second, like that actually turned out to really determine the course of my career. I never went back there, but that experience was really the thing that I built a lot of the rest of my career on. Sure. So what are those reasons, do you think, is it that it taught you how to work a beat and how to like go deeper on something or, or what was it? It actually just gave me subject matter expertise. So I went from there to Scranton, Pennsylvania. I did what I always thought I'd wanted to do, which was work at a local newspaper as a beat reporter. I kind of hated it. And it was a weird time to be like, I was at the New York Times a year ago, and now I'm in Scranton, and I don't know what I'm doing here, and I don't know if I want to do this. And I was looking to get back to D.C. again, partly for personal reasons and partly because I realized there wasn't really a path out anymore from like a small local paper. Like there wasn't a medium sized local paper like waiting to snap me up. And so I went to Inside Higher Ed, which was a trade publication covering higher education. And I went from there to Politico and I still covered higher education policy. And that expertise is what initially got me hired at Vox. And so just not only having had to cover a beat, but like having to learn something about a specific policy area was, it's really crazy that that internship actually is the thing that determined basically the rest of my career on a total whim. And obviously it didn't have to. There are people I interned with there who have gone on to do completely different things. But it was sort of the first step to becoming a beat reporter on the federal higher education beat. And that's really like the path that I followed for the next at least five to six years. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would just say, you know, my impression of you back then, I mean, I would not have picked you to be the one working at Vox years and years later. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thank you for saying that. I, I like, nobody knows me. Like, nobody who knows me now gets how weird it is. It's so weird. I had like, I was like the most traditional person. I wanted to be a straight news reporter at a local paper. And then I would get hired by like a mid sized regional paper. And then when I was like 30, which I thought was very old, I would be hired by the New York Times. And like, that's where I would spend the rest of my career. And instead, like no company I've worked at full time existed when I graduated from college, or at least when I started college, like I've worked exclusively in startups. I've had the most random, it's, it, there's like a total disconnect between what I thought I wanted to do and what I've actually done. 
<laughs> so you were in Scranton, and I imagine you get there. And I mean, I went and was a local news reporter in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And, you know, it's kind of a weird, alienating experience, I would say. <laughs> like, I mean, I had some good times. I wrote some good stories. I had fun. I probably should have enjoyed it more than I did. But my attitude the whole time was just like, get me the hell out of here. So is that why were you you were just applying to everything and you got into insider high inside higher ed because of that or I mean did, did you set out to be this specialist? I had not. I thought that oh I did this internship and it was fun but like now I'm going to go be a local beat reporter which is what I want to do. And as you said, it's weird. I don't think I really realized I had interned in Scranton which is how I ended up there. Really and I I don't want to badmouth them because I owe them big time. They hired me for an internship when nobody wanted to hire me because I was 19 or 20 and had no experience. And they hired me for a job when it was 2010 and nobody wanted to hire me because I was an intern who made good. But the newsroom there especially was really local. I would think I was almost the only person not from there. I was working weird hours. I wasn't really making any friends. I liked being close to New York because I knew people in New York, but it was a weird life. And so I mostly wanted to get to D.C. My boyfriend at the time, Noman, who's a friend of yours, and I were like, well, that's where two journalists can work. And so that's where we should both get jobs. And so I started looking there and I applied mostly what there were in D.C. at the time were like policy trade or hill trade, like politics trade publications. And when I gave my notice in Scranton, they were like, you're going to a trade publication? Really? Like they were shocked that this was something that I would want to do. And I definitely had some doubts about it. I definitely was like, can I really make the leap from here back to bigger publications? Am I going to get stuck covering trades forever? But I knew I didn't want to be where I was. And I looked at this job when it opened up and I was like, holy crap, this is the one job in the world that I am marginally qualified for. By then I had like a more realistic idea of my own qualifications as like a 23 year old. (laughs) Um, And because, you know, I did have that year. I'd, I'd done it as an intern, but like I did know something about it. And So it mostly was like, hey, like, this is a realistic shot. It'll get me off of this path that I'm on. I think I'll enjoy it while I'm doing it. And I get to move back to Washington. And that's why I took it. Cool. So did you ever really seriously consider quitting journalism? No, not then. Haven't ever, really. The the older I get, there's more of a like, oh, I should probably have a realistic plan B. But, you know, I was pretty lucky. And this is, I think, one reason why it was a tough move to make, because I was very aware that I had a job. On the other hand, the people like a year behind us were coming out of school and actually getting on at the Wall Street Journal and the Chicago Tribune. And boy, the like angst of being class of 2009 was never sharper than in like August 2010. Um, And I was thinking, you know, oh, maybe I need to make another shot at trying to get somewhere bigger. But, you know, once I got on in Scranton, I never really felt like, oh, no, like I'm not going to be able to get a job. I'm going to have to do something else. I was able to skip that worst part of the existential crisis. Sure. So you moved to Inside Higher Ed, and how long were you there? And I guess what was that like? When I started, they were like, boy, you've had a lot of jobs. And I told them I would stay for two years, and I stayed for two years and three months. I loved it. I learned so much. I was covering basically anything the federal government does that affects higher education, which was student loans, Pell Grants. And then I sort of set up a side beat covering religious colleges and also covered like the birth control cases in front of the Supreme Court. I covered a college in Georgia where some fundamentalists had sort of taken over and it used to be this very open accepting place and how the faculty were grappling with that. That's one of my favorite things I've done. It was a small publication. It was founded by two former Chronicle of Higher Education reporters who had branched off and wanted to do something different, which a theme in my career is I have worked at places founded by people who got tired of the way the old place was doing things and went to go do their own thing. They knew just so much about colleges and universities in America and how they work. And a thing I wrote in my cover letter that I still really believe is that's a beat where you cover everything. You cover science, you cover politics, you cover research. Any trend that's happening in America is going to show up in colleges and on college campuses. And I really liked it. You know, I definitely had some moments where like, you know, I went to Northwestern and I worked at the Times and here I was like working at this place nobody had heard of. And I had to explain what it was that I did. And it was 
an ego blow in some ways. But once I chilled out about that, I learned a ton. I really did. And I learned how to cover a beat, which was something that I hadn't learned at Medill. And the idea that this is how you cultivate sources, you get to know people. There are people I'm still in touch with who I met as experts or as lobbyists or as people who work in college president's offices and who were sources of mine and are still acquaintances. And yeah, it was a really good learning experience and kind of a springboard to the next couple of things I did. Cool. But yeah, it, it's interesting how I think I've finally managed to get rid of this a little bit. But back then in that era, I remember we were constantly comparing ourselves to our peers, or at least I was, and constantly thinking like, where should I be at? Oh, this person is doing this. So, and the fact that everything was so tough didn't make it easier. Like, it's not like, oh, look, we're all out succeeding. But I constantly worried about them. I finally feel that way now. Like I love looking at like Instagram and being like, look at the cool stuff you're doing. Look at the cool stuff like people from the daily are doing. It's really amazing to see what people are doing, but it did not feel that way at all. When I was like 23, it felt like everybody else has figured it out and I have not. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is just like what being 23 is, honestly. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah, I would agree. (laughs) So yeah. Then how did you get to it's Politico next? And did somebody pull? Yeah, it's Politico. (laughs) It's Politico and then Vox. I got recruited, which was especially after being a class of 2009 grad, the most incredibly flattering thing that has ever happened to me. They wanted to start an education section at Politico Pro, which is their paid product, mostly where people pay truly an insane amount of money so that you can like (laughs) write up something you saw on Twitter and they will know it without having to look at Twitter, which at the time I was like, Twitter is free. Why does this exist? And now I'm like, I would pay a lot of money for someone to write up important things from Twitter so I don't have to be on Twitter. So I truly get it now. But they were launching this education section and they wanted a newsletter writer and someone to write news updates and then the occasional story that would go on the free site and in print. This was the last time I was in print. And I kind of knew the job would be terrible in some ways, but... I also knew Politico was still like a pretty hot place to work and it was not a trade publication and they offered me a lot more money than I was making, which by today's standards, I mean, whatever, it was $53,000, which in 2013 seemed like an actual fortune to me. And so I took it and I worked there for 10 months and (laughs) then I moved. I was not looking to leave. I was not particularly happy, but I knew that I couldn't keep changing jobs every 15 months for the rest of my life. And the opportunity to go to Vox came out of nowhere and fell into my lap. And so I took it. I guess the one thing I forgot to ask, and I wanted to ask just to understand a bit the dynamics of the job you were doing. So were you going to a lot of hearings and things? Were you out a lot reporting or how exactly was that part of the job? Yeah, I was going to some hearings. That was stuff I'd done at Inside Higher Ed. Like I I knew the subcommittee on higher education in the House pretty well. I had the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee. The main thing I was doing was I was writing a daily newsletter. And those jobs have one extreme upside, which is that you are out there every day and your name is out there every day and you have to write every day. And I think It actually was really good for me. I learned a lot of discipline. I learned how to write conversationally while writing about very wonky, detailed policy areas. But it also sucks because, like, the newsletter goes out at 5 a.m. And so (laughs) I would usually finish it at, like, 7 or 8 p.m. Education is not a big enough news area where I had to do this every day. But there definitely were days when I would wake up at 4, at least to, like, check my phone and make sure nothing had happened overnight before it went out, maybe it went out at six, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. It goes out way earlier in the morning than I wake up. And then you like do it all again. And it's a grind. And like, I knew it would be a grind when I took it. And I definitely learned a lot from it. It's now with like seven years of distance between me and that. I'm like, oh, I learned a lot from that. And it was useful. <laughs> but, you know, at the time, there were some pretty clear negatives. And it at the time, Politico had a reputation as a very fast paced, sink or swim place to work. And I kind of floated. I neither sank nor swam. But (laughs) I wasn't horribly opposed to the idea of doing something else. But going somewhere, Vox didn't exist when I left Politico. And that was the scariest leap I've had to take in my career. It was like, they liked me. I was doing a pretty good job. There were a lot of things I liked about working at Politico. It wasn't perfect. And it was like, do I stay at this not perfect, but obviously a clear path job? Or do I take a leap on this sexy, scary new thing? And yeah. That was where that ended after 
10 months. And how did you get connected with Vox? I believe I've seen you say on Twitter you were like the 6th or 16th employee of Vox or something like that. So you were there. I think I was the 14th. Yeah, there were like six or so. I think I was the 14th. There were 14 people when I started, 13 or 14. I kind of got it by being good at Twitter, which is the most 2013 way to get a job. Dylan Matthews, who was at Wonk Blog at the Washington Post and was part of the first cohort that founded Vox with Ezra Klein and Matt Iglesias, had written about higher education before and knew my work. And we had met once or twice. We didn't know each other well at all. But after the news came out that he was leaving the Post and Ezra was leaving the Post and they were going to like go do a new thing, he was friends with my roommate and happened to be at a party at my house. And I met him once or twice. And I said, so I guess there are going to be maybe some like writing about higher education jobs open at the Post. Should I look into those? And he was like, I wouldn't do that if I were you we have your name on a list. And I was like, what on earth does that mean? And then we went up about our business at this party and Ezra Klein emailed me. I'd never met him, never spoken to him, emailed me out of the blue a week or two later and was like, hey, let's get lunch. I want to talk to you about an opportunity. And so we did. And he did. And he really sold me on this idea that we were going to try to translate policy for real people and write about the things that really mattered and do this like fun, new, exciting thing. I tried to negotiate my salary. It was a hilarious disaster. He was like, you can get a raise where you are. You can come do this cool new thing with us. And I was like, cool, I will come and do this cool new thing with you. And I did. So we were three weeks away from launching when I joined and we did not have a name. We were still called Project X at (laughs) Media. (laughs) And like, man, it was good. You know, like I was 26. I had no family. I had nothing really depending on me. And I still was like, boy, am I going to go join this website that doesn't have a name? And I thought there's a good chance this crashes and burns in a year, but I will have had a pretty high profile and a lot of exposure. And if it crashes and burns very publicly, hopefully there will be someone who helps me get a job. Like that was really a major part of my thought process because you can't be a real optimist if you're in journalism. Yeah, no, that's a very good understanding of how the industry works, that you knew that that would be a path out potentially. Because, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you gain notoriety, you still come out ahead. I don't know, which, yeah, I think we learned gradually that you can't be this nameless, faceless person in the crowd. Like, I think, you know, we came out of school and thinking, if we check all these boxes, this is how it works and people will give us a job. And it's not necessarily how it works. Yeah, it's really not. And I definitely thought if I'm going to be on the market in a year or two looking better to do it was part of somebody who tried something big and made some connections. And that was a really different way of looking at it than I had a couple of years before that, where I was like, well, you know, I have all these clips. I was the editor of the paper. I had all these internships. Of course, someone will want to hire me. Why wouldn't you? And I think the industry just really changed a lot, even in that short amount of time. Right. So uh, you've been at Vox now, what, seven, eight years, you said? Six and a half. Six and a half. <laughs> um, I was doing, I was like, what month is it? I started on St. Patrick's Day, 2014. <laughs> so good way to remember it. I have a weird memory for dates. I'm pretty good at remembering dates, but that one is easy to remember. So it's been just over six and a half years. Cool. And I guess, yeah, just tell us a little bit about it, what I guess the highlights were and at what point it became clear things were working out. Yeah. I mean, a funny thing is this is way longer than I frankly ever thought I would have a job, but I've also had like four different jobs, Um, at least three different jobs in six years. I started as an education reporter and working at a startup in media in the brief blink of time between 2013 and 2016, when venture capitalists wanted to invest in media, was just, it was this unreal experience. It was like such a specific place in time. And it really felt like we were a group of like 14 to 20 people when we started, mostly in their late 20s and early 30s. It really felt like someone had given a college newspaper a couple of million dollars and was like, (laughs) go do whatever you want with it. Which is not to say that we were blowing it on parties or expensive snacks, but just actually, I think we had more sense of freedom than I ever did as like a very straight-laced daily Northwestern student of like, let's just try this. And nobody was here to say like, no, you can't do it that way because that's not the way we do it. We were building the plane and flying it simultaneously. We launched three weeks after I was hired and I started the same day as most of the staff, which is now insane to me. Like I'm working on a project that's going to run next March. And I'm like, is that enough time? I don't know if that's enough time. And then I'm like, we made this website in three weeks. We can do it. So, (laughs) you know, there was just like, we kind of knew what we wanted to do, but we were really just figuring it out as we went along. And there was a lot of freedom and there was a lot of money and it was magical. 
and it absolutely could not last. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways we're a better website than we were then. But, oh, my God, being in an early stage startup was incredibly fun. I don't know if I have the energy to do it again, but it was just incredibly, incredibly fun. 2014-15 was like just an extraordinary year professionally because I would be like, I have an idea. Like, I want to write about this or about that. And they'd be like, OK, let's do it. Let's try it. Let's see if that works. If that doesn't work, we'll try something else. And we had a decent amount of success, both in terms of recognition and traffic, like pretty much right away. And so it really felt like, oh, like we're doing this, like things are going to be okay. And it was expanding extremely rapidly. I have no idea how many people work there now, but I mean, you must be considered some old timer at this point. I I am absolutely an old timer. I've been there longer than anybody, but maybe five or six people at this point. And we have, I don't know how many people we have now at our peak. I think we had about 200 staff. So we had grown more than tenfold in five years. And a lot of that growth happened in like a pretty condensed two year period between like 2015 and 2016. So I mean, that is great. Even on days when things aren't great, every job has days when things aren't great. It's like, like I help build this. Like I help come up with this and we're still here and we're doing it and we're doing good work. And that's really cool to have experienced. So I started off as an education reporter. And a thing we discovered is when you have a pretty small staff and you're pretty selective about what you're covering, education news, however important, is not often the most important thing to write about that day. And so I sort of became more and more of a general assignment type as we went along. And eventually piloted this project as a reporter where it was like a small team that was meant to be like very reactive to the news of the day and to sort of capture the like startup you feel we had at the beginning of just waking up and being like, okay, what's on the internet? What can we report out? What questions are people going to have about the news today? And that sort of put me on a path toward editing. This was in early 2016. And that was that I was in sort of a hybrid reporter, editor, leadership strategy role. And that was when I learned that I really enjoy working on some of the behind the scenes stuff around strategy and thinking through coverage and making assignments more than I had expected I would. I guess I'm not terribly surprised since you were the editor of the Daily Northwestern, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess you had taken a detour from that. Well, and nobody thinks they want to be an editor, right? Like editors are the boring people who like tell you what you can't do. Um, <laughs> and... You know, I, I really liked being a reporter, but I, I love being an editor. I actually really, I find editing to be more rewarding on a day-to-day basis than reporting was for me. Interesting. So at what point were you doing editing full-time? In 2017, we were kind of in flux and we just needed editing help. And my boss sat me down and just said, we've never really talked about your ambitions and about your career and where you want to go from here because you've always seemed happy, but have you ever thought about editing? And I said, yeah, sure. In like five or 10 years. And she was like, okay, but how about now? Um, How about we make you an editor now? And I was like, oh, I guess I've never really thought about it. And I was in, I think a lot of reporters in Washington were at this point early in the Trump administration where it was like, what do I do? Like covering federal higher education policy or federal education policy in general, or even like education doesn't feel like the most crucial contribution I can make to our understanding of the world. And so I'd been casting around for a new beat. I hadn't really found one. We'd been trying out a few things to see if they worked. And so I was a little bit, it was sort of a natural transition point for me. I'd been on the beat for a long time on education. I was burning out a little bit. I'd been doing more and more general new stuff over the past year. And so I kind of thought, why not? And it started as, oh, I'll write some of the time and I'll probably edit one or two people. But we needed more editing help than that. And so I ended up editing full time. I took an editing test and got the job and ended up editing full time almost immediately on the policy and politics team, which was the team I'd worked on as a reporter. Gotcha. And is that the team you're on still now? It's the team I'm on still now. I mean, we've grown. I've shuffled around a little bit, but I've worked in the same department for basically all seven years at Vox. Cool. So... uh... I guess next we can talk a little bit about the election. I don't know that I have very specific questions. I don't think I know enough to have very specific questions. So I guess I was just wondering if there was anything you thought was interesting about this whole process of covering this election. Yeah, no, I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? Because it's like, on the one hand, this feels like an incredibly crucial moment for It sounds insane to say out loud we're like a crucial moment for American democracy, but like I really believe that's where we are and that we're at a crossroads. And at the same time, it is really difficult day to day to figure out how to cover it. So Vox cares a lot about policy, which I define sort of broadly as 
legislation or court decisions or anything the government does affects people's lives across all kinds of areas, education, healthcare, drugs, criminal justice, basically anything domestic. And at the one hand, I believe that elections are important because elections have consequences and those consequences are usually about policy. And we have a responsibility to explain what candidates want to do with their power and how they would use it and all of that. And on the other hand, this isn't a policy election. And I had a day where I was like, it just feels insane to like run down the list and assign somebody to write about all of Joe Biden's plans for X or Y when like everyone knows that that's not what this is being decided on. (laughs) So that's been kind of the central tension for me is like, how do I do this work that to me generally feels like very crucial and important and valuable without conveying that, oh, yeah, like all of this is going to rise or fall on the specific particularities of Joe Biden's public option in his health care plan. So that's the opportunity and the danger in this moment is it's not like previous moments, but that makes it both hard to figure out what to do with it and an opportunity to do something new. Right. So your title is technically policy editor. Senior deputy policy editor. I report up to the policy editor. We work together and my boss is really more like the policy and ideas editor is really probably a better way to think about it. The essay is advancing an argument about like, this is what the Supreme Court should look like, or this is a really in-depth reported piece about issues with American democracy. Like that's our section. And then I also do some of the more bread and butter, like Joe Biden's health care plan explains assignments and edits. I was wondering yeah, about the title because I was wondering if there was a separate team that did more of the politics, more of the not so substantive parts of the election, which do really matter right now. Or is it all you guys? So we are together a policy and politics team, and we all believe that the two can't really be separated, right? You can't achieve policy without politics, and politics matters because of the consequences that are often policy. But there is a separate politics editor with a separate politics team that covers the Hill and is covering the Senate races and all of that. So there's a lot of crossover. Sometimes, especially in the primary, a politics reporter would write about a plan from a candidate they were covering, and I would edit it to make sure it had the elements I think a policy story needs to have, which is basically what is the problem, you know, the perceived problem this is trying to solve, and what would it do about it, and would it work? But they report up to a different editor. But Vox is a pretty collaborative place. We all work together and there's never, oh, like that's policy. I'm not going to touch it. Or, oh, like that's too politics for us. It's beneath us. But just in terms of like institutional structure, like, yes, there are teams that do both. Cool. Yeah. I'm just always curious how that sort of thing works. So you said there's this, you know, central tension in this election. We're now, what, a little over a month to the election. Do you feel like you've managed that tension well? And what, what was the answer there, do you think? Yeah, I mean, we're 34 days out. Uh, To be specific, I have a countdown going. (laughs) I think for me and for our work, I really decided that focusing on the pandemic and focusing on the economy are the most important things we can do right now. And it's very weird at this point in an election for me to be spending time on anything that isn't pretty directly related to the election itself. But I think continuing to ask, how can we do better at containing COVID-19 literally any possible way that it's different from what we're already doing is the answer to that. Or like, what can we learn from other countries and their pandemic response? Or for whom is the economic recovery working and for whom is it not? Like those to me actually are the questions that are going to matter the most on January 21st, no matter what happens. Plus the really big questions about like, how bad are things in terms of the state of democracy, which is also sort of on my team, but I deal less with those assignments. My boss usually handles those. So I ask myself this question all the time. I asked it when I was watching the debate. I feel like I know what the answer is, but is this what rock bottom looks like? No, because there's another debate in two weeks. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I actually would be really interested, like how you see it and what you hear living in another country, because I can't imagine what the world thinks of America right now. I've read some interesting stories along those lines, but I remember thinking in 2016, oh, these debates are insane. I've never seen anything like this. And those were like a totally normal political undertaking compared to yesterday. And who knows what's going to happen in the next 34 days. So I definitely don't want to say this is as bad as it's going to get, because I think one thing we've learned this year is like, it can always get worse. Okay, that's why, you know, I, every time I've asked that question, it has gotten worse. So I feel like now <laughs> I, I'm always like, no, it, it will probably get worse. Which I Have guess you considered you should stop asking the question? <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. 
But yeah, it was interesting watching it here in Brazil and, you know, seeing Brazilian Twitter all watching it. And I don't know, I'm kind of curious. I, I unfortunately wasn't here four years ago in China. You know, the debate wasn't exactly on TV in China. Um, and so, yeah, like it seemed like very high interest and a lot of people were watching. And like I went to the federal police today to sort out my immigration, which has been delayed because of coronavirus and the police officer there knew all about the debate and i was like wow interest is high and everybody's is like crazy everybody's like yeah it's a mess and you know there's this high level of awareness that it is a mess that i wonder did they pay this close of attention four years ago maybe maybe not but yeah i mean just watching it you do get the impression of what you would imagine like being in a foreign country watching an election that's kind of I don't know. I don't want to say a joke, but like, you know, it's not what you would expect from the United States. I thought I could be watching a debate in Latin America or something like that. And then, I don't know, we as Americans, I still believe a little bit in American exceptionalism, even though I know I shouldn't. It's just so inbred to us. And watching this really made me wonder, like, yeah, that's probably not right. We really aren't different. We really aren't head and shoulders above the rest of the world, which I don't know if it's terrible to think that or if it's just finally I've realized what the reality has yeah. always been. Yeah. I, I mean, I know what you mean. I think this year has been that even after everything in the last three years or four years and really, you know, forever, like this year has really been that experience for a lot of people of, I mean, the degree to which the U.S. has just been unable to cope with the pandemic is shocking. And then the election on top of that, it absolutely, it really does leave you questioning what, if anything, actually is unique or better about how we handle things, either as like a people or as a system of government. And I don't have an answer for that. Right. Yeah. I guess we'll have to see how it goes. I mean, here in Brazil, people always talk about, well, the the institutions are surviving. The institutions haven't crumbled yet. So things are still okay. And I think, I mean, that's the hope in the U.S., but, uh, you know, now with the Supreme Court and all this. I didn't realize that's what they say in Brazil, too. That's really interesting. Yeah, because that's absolutely people say, oh, but the norms, you know, I mean, we've lost some norms, but the institutions are still okay. But, like, are they? I don't know if they are. They don't seem that okay. Yeah, but the, anyway, that's cool that you can kind of focus on these bigger questions. And I and just those few examples give me a better sense of how it works, like what kind of questions you're asking about the economy and about coronavirus. Let me see. Any other things you want to highlight about covering this? The only other thing I'd say is that the pace of news over the last four or five years has been just intense. And on the one hand, it's a good time to be in a position where you can hopefully give people some context and some perspective and let them feel like they don't have to watch everything that happens. But on the other hand, like it really takes a toll to be this plugged in. And one thing I was seeing you know, on Twitter last night from friends who aren't journalists or people I follow for other reasons were like, nobody has to watch the debate. And I always get kind of like sniffy about that because I'm like, man, like it's it's actually really important. I don't know who wins an election matters a lot. and You should be civically engaged or whatever. And then 20 minutes into it, I was like, you really don't. It's fine to step back and read some coverage tomorrow from this. And that inability to step back, I think, has been one of the more challenging things about the past few years. Is It's just always something. And especially this year, it's always something bad. And just figuring out how you keep up in the way that you need to to do your job, but also have enough perspective to do your job well is really difficult. Right. Okay. So the next section is more about stories. And I like to start with a story. What is a story that quote unquote got away? A story that you wanted to do or a project and you were never able to because of whatever reason you couldn't get the information you needed. You couldn't get editorial support, reporting trips went wrong or anything like that. Does anything come to mind, a story that you always wanted to do but hadn't been able to? There's a very immediate one here. The big one that comes to mind for me is I had this idea, a pretty ambitious idea in 2015 to do a big profile of Arnie Duncan, who was the education secretary at the time, and just like tell the story of education policy over the Obama era through him. And my editors were into it and I did a reporting trip. I had an invitation. He was doing some kind of like press junket bus tour across Iowa. And I did that and the interviews were okay, but I didn't really have what I needed. And I don't think I really knew what I needed. And honestly, it was really probably too ambitious for the level I was at 
at the time. Like now if a reporter with a few years of experience suggested this to me, I would be like, cool, like let's sit down and plan out exactly how you want to do this because that is a big swing. And it just never felt very compelling. Like I never quite had the idea that would really make it work beyond this is an important person. And I would like to do some really interesting interviews with him. The other part of it, not to deflect the blame for myself, is some people are better interviews than others. And Arnie Duncan Grimm's a great soundbite, but is not somebody who I was going to get him to really reflect for like hours. And I think pulling off the idea I wanted to do really required probably a level of perspective that a subject can't have on themselves while they're in office. So that was really the one. I had really big dreams of I'm going to write like the definitive piece on what Obama's education policy was through the guy who carried it out as like the longest serving cabinet member. And it just kind of never came together. It's the only time that anywhere has paid for a reporting trip for me and like nothing has come out of it. But it just didn't ever really work. Well, obviously it happens to a lot of us. I mean, (laughs) I certainly have a lot of stories that haven't come off. But where was the reporting trip to? It was in Iowa. I was on a bus with him for a while. I got a good amount of time. Like I asked for some time and they gave me the time. And I think actually somewhere in the very voice memos I'm recording it, there's still a file of my interviews with him. But I think, and it's actually much more obvious to me as I talk about it now, even though it's been five years, I don't think I ever quite knew what I wanted to get it to say. And so I did some outlines and I did some drafts and it just wasn't coming together. And this was September, or October 2015, I want to say. And then I got sucked into the 2016 election and it quit feeling like the most important thing in the world to spend my time on. And at some point, I don't think we ever like made an explicit decision about this, but there was kind of a quiet consensus to like, let's cut our losses from this piece. You're sinking a lot of time into it and it's not really getting any better. And we all moved on. But I really wish I could have pulled that one together. That was probably the like white whale of policy profile writing that I didn't ever achieve. Yeah. No, but I I get what you mean, those kind of long read profile stories. But yeah, if the person themselves can't give you stuff that's compelling, I I don't think it's all on you, that one. As an editor, I'm not like listening to myself describe this. And I'm like, yeah, it's very obvious this wasn't going to work because what was the point? A lot of things happened, but I didn't really have a way to tie it all together. I probably could have gotten there, but I also was like changing editors, like a lot of stuff was happening in the background that just made it difficult to pull off. But it was a bummer. It was a bummer to get a good amount of face time with somebody who it's not super easy to get long interviews with and just kind of have it not turn. And you say now you realize what the problem was and that it wouldn't have worked out. But just to elaborate a little bit, how has your perspective on journalism changed as an editor now? I really think... All reporters and writers should occasionally have to edit and all editors should occasionally have to write because I think they inform one another really, really well. The complaint I always had as a reporter about editors is like, oh, they won't let me write these longer meandering leads and they think they know the point of the story better than I do. And now I'm an editor and I'm like, yeah, your tops are too long and you're not getting to the point. Like you're missing what I, an editor, found interesting about this. You can kind of be blinkered by your own expertise. And... I never was a particularly self-conscious writer. And when I try to write, I'm definitely more self-conscious than I used to be because I'm like aware of all of the ways that I would edit it. Writing is so much harder than editing. I had to write just a quick thing. I like that we needed a warm body to help with Ruth Bader Ginsburg coverage. And I stepped in and helped. And I was like, oh my God, starting with a blank page, I'd forgotten how much more intimidating it is from starting with the page with words on it. But I think I'm a lot more focused on what's going to make somebody want to read this or like, what does this story offer? Like, what understanding does the story offer to the reader that they don't already have? And that's just really tough to see when you're the writer and you're really like caught up in the day to day and the details and the amount of information that you're accumulating and that you have in your head and that you're trying to communicate in a short pitch or a short story or a short conversation with an editor. Right. I agree that those lines should be crossed more. And honestly, at Reuters, I feel like it's probably not done enough. I bring up Reuters just because I've compared notes with somebody at Agence France Press, and they put Mm -hmm. everybody who comes in the door first on the editing desk. Everything is opposite. And they're like, if you do good on the editing desk for two or three years, we'll send you out in the field. And now he's a frontline reporter in Pakistan. And I don't know, it it kind of on a certain level makes sense to me that they would do it that way. So he's out there and he knows what the office wants. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think with that, so I've been an editor now um, full time for, oh my God, over three years. Wow. This whole podcast is me being amazed at the passage of time. Um, (laughs) So I felt like in my career as a reporter, the three year mark was finally when I was like, like, first you think you're really good. 
And then you realize all the stuff that you don't know, or at least this was my trajectory. And you're like, oh, I actually don't know anything. And then like three, four years is when I started to be like, oh, no, like I actually do think I know what I'm doing and I've earned it a little bit. And I feel that way with editing, too. Like as much as they complement each other, it's also a completely different skill set. And being able to look at a story and both see what's on the page and see what it needs to be is hard. And so I do think that the risk in something like that is you just get good at editing. You know, it's like, okay, now go do this like different thing that is informed by editing, but it's also a totally different skill set. So it takes you six years to get good at your job instead of three. Right. And then, yeah, the next question, if there's a story that comes to mind that you're proud of, that you can talk us through, tell us a little bit of what it was about, how you went about reporting or editing it, and just kind of the whole process from start to finish. I'm going to do two super quickly when I was the reporter on and when I edited. Sure. Reporting, I touched on this briefly earlier, but when I was at Inside Higher Ed, I also covered religious colleges. And I don't even remember how I heard about this. But there was a religious school in Georgia, like a lot of colleges in America, was nominally affiliated with the church, but was basically like a normal college. And it was taken over by like a way more conservative faction of the church. And all of a sudden, faculty were being asked to sign statements of faith and say that they believed homosexuality was a sin and all kinds of other sort of hardline doctrines. And I got to go down there. There was basically a faculty revolt in process and just sort of talk to them about it. And what was interesting about it to me is there are a lot of religious colleges in America that are church affiliated and name only, but otherwise not really distinct from other small private colleges. And then there are a lot of church affiliated colleges that are like really churchy. But there aren't a lot of opportunities where one becomes the other or mm. or like places where it crosses. And so the one thing about policy reporting in the trades is it can be kind of dry. You're mostly going to committees and dealing with documents. And this was a real chance to talk to people, a lot of whom had been at that institution their entire careers and were just incredibly upset about what was happening to it. And that was a cool story. That was a really memorable reporting trip for me and a really memorable story to really just try to accurately depict the two sides of this culture war at a, a small Georgia college that most people had never heard of. I mean, it wasn't the most headliney story I did, but it was one of my favorites that I worked on. So that one, I, I wish I remember how I heard about it. It was 2012, and I just don't. But I think there were a few alumni groups set up on Facebook and stuff who were sort of rallying around this, and I talked to all of those people. I persuaded my bosses to let me go down there for three days. I did a ton of interviews with people who were willing to go on the record about how they felt like this institution had just totally been turned away. And they were waging some kind of court battle for control as well, simultaneously. And I went through a few drafts. My process always was very, I started at the beginning and I write all the way through and then I stop. Did a lot of revision. And it was just, you know, one of the few really featurey feature stories I've gotten to write. And I was really proud of that. Cool. Just to get, I guess, a little bit of a sense of the color. I mean, do you remember how you let off the story or was there some kind of broader takeaway you tried to get in there or I guess, I don't know, a nut graph or something? Yeah, let me pull it up, actually, because I know there was. OK, half of my stuff, a weird thing about the Internet is they always told us the Internet was forever. But like so many of my stories have disappeared. But this one is still findable. So th the thing that I was the most interested in about this story and the reason I was interested in covering religious colleges in general is there's always kind of this tension, at least between like more hardline versions of American Christianity and like the tenets of higher education. And I was always really interested in that culture clash between kind of a liberal, open higher education philosophy and faculty who have PhDs and have been trained in that versus a faith that says to work here, you have to believe the earth was 6,000 years old. And that tension was always what really fascinated me. And so the net graph is sort of about, this is partly a story about a tight-knit academic community that has been torn apart, but it's also about what tradition is more powerful, your faith or academic freedom, whose values dictate what happens on a campus and what does it mean to be a Christian college. And actually, I'm rereading this and go, oh, this is a better net graph than I remember. Um, but it, it really got at <laughs> like the tension, not just that like what interested me about that story, but why I had been drawn to that beat in general. Yeah, that's cool. And did you lead off with an anecdote or did you play it more straight or how did you do it? I led with an anecdote. It was not an anecdote I witnessed, but it was the turning point when faculty and staff at this college were called together and given the articles of faith that they would have to sign if they wanted to keep their jobs. And I had done enough interviews, like it was very classic. I've done almost no writing like this, but it was very classic. I could get in people's heads and say what they were thinking as they listened to it. 
reading it now, I'm like, wait, this is a really long lead. I would have moved my nut graph up if I were an editor in <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> But yeah, I, I kind of started like in the middle of the story and then flashed back to how it all began. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. And yeah, there was a second story you wanted to highlight that you were an editor on, not a reporter? Yeah, I just wanted to talk briefly about the experience of editing. I worked on a major project that we did last year called Everybody Covered, which was about basically systems of health insurance around the world. And our idea was we were at the moment of the Democratic primary where everything was about Medicare for all versus not Medicare for all. And we really wanted to give a sense, not that there's like one model abroad that the U.S. should take, but that there are different ways to get better insurance coverage and better outcomes than we have and to just look at several uh, different options. So there were three reporters on it who went to Taiwan, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and then a cost containment experience in the United States and Australia. Australia is the other one. And I was one of the lead editors on it. And it was just a really incredibly rewarding project to work on. I feel like we had kind of a mission for what we wanted readers to learn. We kind of achieved it, which was great. And it was a chance, you know, in, in internet journalism, a lot of things are really fast paced. Usually I will go through one draft on a story and make it 30 to 50% better. And then we publish because we have to publish because it's newsy. And this was really an opportunity to go through multiple drafts and really hone in on what we were trying to portray and whether the details and the anecdotes we were using fit with the story and how we were telling it. And it was just a really, a really, really interesting project to work on that really drove home to me what I like about editing, because I think the, the best parts of editing are being able to be a partner to a reporter as they figure that stuff out and to be a sounding board. And I just really appreciated the opportunity to get to do that. Did you get to play like, I always wonder what this is like to say, I know what my boss's job is, but to have X number of people who report to you and to be able to kind of move the pieces around and apply them how you like, like you get to see more of the whole chessboard. I mean, were you very active when people were out in the field in all these different places? You know, they call back, you kind of talk through how it's going and figure that out or how did that all work? Yeah, we had meetings before they left. I also just learned a lot about managing reporters in the field because that's not something we do a ton of, but we had a grant for international travel. And so we were able to do that. And so we started with a meeting that was like, what do you already have? What do you need to get? Like, what's the ideal version of the story? Who are you talking to? And I also learned a lot about reporting from my reporters. I mean, they had been really good at finding the people they knew they wanted to talk to or the examples. And he was like, yeah, like we found these patients who were twins in Australia and one gave birth at the private hospital system and one gave birth at the public hospital system. And I'm like, how did you find this? Like, that's exactly what yeah, you wow. want for a story like this. I wish I remember the answer mostly, but it was just, a thing that I learned is how much pre-reporting and pre-work really goes in to make the difference between a pretty good reporting trip and a really good reporting trip. Um, and then while he was out, the main reporter would like, but we didn't talk on the phone because uh, the time zones were insane, but he would write like a long email when he wrapped up a day or so being like, here's everything I found. And not only was it really gratifying to me to be like, oh my gosh, he's getting such great stuff. This is the thing. There's just a lot of joy in editing. When a writer comes back and is like, that was a great interview. Like, I am probably happier about it than they are. It's just really cool to see stuff come together. But those notes actually were also really useful when he sat down to write because it was sort of a way of capturing the impressions of the day in a more informal way. And I was able to say, like, this is the part that jumped out at me. Have you thought about making a section based on that? And to have some back and forth. So that was really cool. The other thing is, you probably are this way. I think a lot of writers are perfectionists and they finish a story and they always think about, here's how this could have been better. And I have a little bit of that as an editor, but I also live like, I know what your rough draft looked like and I know what the version we published looked like. And they really do the hard work. I just put in notes and suggestions, but understanding that difference is one of the reasons that editing is so gratifying to me. Yeah, no, a great editor makes all the difference. I mean, I've had great editors, I've had bad editors, and a great editor, you know, maybe there'll be some tension along the way. You know, I do finish writing a story and I'm like, I wrote it this way for a reason. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, you get into some fights because of that, but it's all uh, like uh, at the end when the piece comes out, I'm always like, this is definitely way better than it was. The worst thing I ever did as a writer, I can't believe I did this now. I really want to write to my old boss, who I like got along with very well and apologized to him about this one incident. I was at Inside Higher Ed. I was pretty new on the job. And I was doing a story that I think was a little more analytical or a little more of a step back than I usually did. I was very much out of my depth. And he rewrote most of it. And I put his byline on it when it published, 
which now I'm like, oh my God, that was so passive aggressive. Like if somebody did that to me, we would be having a sit down to talk about like what editing is and if they're okay with the changes that I'm making. But I really was just like, well, those weren't my words. They were his words. He deserves a byline. And yeah, he was normally a really good editor, but that was the one time when I was like, that did not feel like I wrote it. And it was very strange to have my byline on it. Yeah. It's a, a weird thing where in the moment it's hard to see what is better and what is worse. It all seems subjective, but then with a little bit of distance, so you can easily see what is better. No, but I mean, that's what you hope as an editor too. Cause yeah, there are times when I'm like, mm, you're not going to like these edits. And sometimes I don't even know if they're the right ones. It's really interesting that two good editors can look at a story and make very different changes, but you just, you hope that in the end, they feel like the end result was better than where you started. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, next up is the lightning round. It's a series of faster paced questions. You can feel free to speak as long or as short as you like. Do you feel ready? I do. First off, what is a must read publication that you look at almost every day? And I mean more for your work than just for personal edification. I know everyone reads the New York Times. I was just going to say my, my very boring answer to this is going to be the New York Times. No, actually, my answer in 2020 is the Atlantic. I think they are the place that's doing the work that in terms of what I'm trying to do, I am the most jealous of day in and day out. And I definitely want to see what they're doing, frankly, in case they did something that I want to do better than I was going to do it or even worse than I was going to do it at first. And I have sent a fellow Medill alum, Derek Thompson, a note saying I am super jealous of your work. So this is public knowledge. They're doing some good work this year. What is a publication you read, listen to, or watch for fun, but a journalistic publication? And it can be any medium. Oh, man. The line between fun and work is always blurry. Um, <laughs> I would say a lot of my podcasts probably are the closest to things I listen to purely for fun, but that still sort of live in the journalism world. Anything sort of narrative, nonfiction, repertorial, in the dark was definitely one of those. Wind of Change, which was like about whether the CIA wrote a hit song in the 80s. Those probably <laughs> sort of tiptoe the lines the most between journalism and fun. Otherwise, a lot of things end up blurring into one another. Like I'll read something because I enjoy it and I'll end up getting an idea or I'll be reading something for work and then I'm like, oh, I'm actually really enjoying this and it turns into fun. And then the next one is what is the best journalistic article piece, whatever journalistic again, you have consumed recently? The answer to this is super obvious, but like 900,000 words the New York Times wrote about Trump's taxes. Like in the last week, it's really hard to top that. That's true. Yeah. What a huge scoop. Yeah. I, anything else I can say would be, would be disingenuous. It was definitely that. And then is there any particular subject matter you read into or geek out about that isn't related to your job? God, so many. I have a lot of weird, obsessive consumption habits, probably food and cooking. Like I consume a lot of food media and a lot of cooking content and my ideal burnout, not burnout in the sense of like I wouldn't have to do any work, but my like, I'm tired of the news, but still want to work in writing and editing somehow would be to cross over into food media. I have a very, very active home cook and do read a lot of cookbooks and magazines and recipes and all of that. And then how do you manage your work-life balance or do you even believe in it? Uh, I definitely believe in it. Given that my desk is, I just measured literally three inches from my bed right now. So I'm not sure that I do a great job managing it. One thing, I, I guess this ties a little bit into what I was talking about with the insane pace of news. I have to have times when I'm not looking at my phone. I do try to put my phone down around 11. Like, I'm a night owl, so I'm usually up until about one. And I usually try to put my phone down for the last couple hours before I go to bed and do like anything else. I think working from home which I'd never done full time before March has been great and terrible for work life balance because I can take more breaks during the day. I can like make myself a nice lunch if I have a few minutes and, you know, want to get away from my screen. But also my laptop is always right there and I'm literally living in my office. So it's a particular challenge now, but I definitely believe in it. I definitely need a lot of exercise and physical activity to like get my mind off of stuff, getting into the kitchen, doing yoga, anything that like keeps my hands or my body busy and keeps my mind off of it and my eyes off of Twitter is helpful to me. That's good. And goes right into our next question, which is, is Twitter important to you? Ugh, yes, but I wish it weren't, I think is the answer to that. I took a full month off of Twitter in July and August because it was just getting overwhelming for a bunch of reasons. I have not put the app back on my phone. I've gotten a lot better about having it open during the day. It's tough, especially as an editor, because you want 
to know what conversations are happening out there to make sure you're making assignments, but you also don't want Twitter to be your assignment editor. So I'm always trying to strike that balance. It's also like, I've not really figured out how to be an editor on Twitter. Reporters obviously have expertise and knowledge and work to tweet out. And I've never quite made that transition from being like a public facing byline person to being somebody whose work is done behind the scenes. Interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that division. The next question is, if you had to trade places with one journalist living or dead and you would have their career, who would it be? Oh, man. Maybe Linda Greenhouse or Nina Totenberg. In an alternate reality, I always would have wanted to be a Supreme Court reporter because I think it taps into a lot of what I like about what I do now, but also with a degree of like pomp and circumstance and formality and stakes that are really interesting to me. Who are these two people, just for uh, people who aren't familiar? Yeah, sorry. Also, interestingly, both probably two of the most visible female reporters in America. I didn't realize that until I said it. Nina Totenberg is the longtime Supreme Court correspondent for NPR. Linda Greenhouse had that position at the time, so I think she retired or semi-retired a few years ago. And then what do you bring to the table that makes you a good journalist? I think I am both very curious. And very ignorant. And I try to lead into both of those things. I think one of the most valuable things you can do as a reporter is to understand where readers are coming from and the level of knowledge that they have. And it's really important, especially for reporters, I think, to have some expertise and some context. And the one thing I would like recommend that reporters do is try to build that. But especially as an editor, it's really useful to put myself in the shoes of a reader and be like, this is interesting to me. This is what's confusing to me. This is the understanding I would really like to gain. And I'm just curious about a lot of stuff. I'm a very curious person. And I think that's probably the thing that's been the biggest asset to me in my career. And then what is one thing you wish you could travel back and tell your younger self? It's going to be okay. I mean, really, I feel like sometimes I think I'd like to be 23 again when like the stakes are so much lower and nothing really matters. But like, I didn't feel that way when I was 23. I felt like any mistake I made or any job I didn't get was going to like ruin the rest of my life. And it didn't turn out that way. And that's the thing I I try to tell our interns and and other people who are sort of new in the business is like, you may not have exactly the, the path that you think you're going to have, but like, it will be okay one way or another. And this is not the highest life or death stakes thing you're ever going to do in your life. What is one thing most people don't know about you? (laughs) I'm such an overshare. I'm actually struggling to think about what what (laughs) the answer to this question is. Oh, this is one. I have read every mystery story Agatha Christie has ever written and probably like most of the major mysteries published between like 1920 and 1950. That is a very weirdo specific area of expertise that I have that absolutely never comes into play on a daily basis. Wow. That's a lot. I mean, she wrote a lot. It's a lot. Um, yeah, she's written like a hundred books and I've, I've read all of them, I think, multiple times starting when I was a kid. So I had some time to build this up. That's pretty cool to have under your belt. This is a new one I added mostly to try to get new questions for this section. But what is a question you would like to ask other journalists? I do ask people this sometimes, but mostly when I'm like interviewing them for jobs, what they like most about not just their career, but like the specific day to day of what they do now. The other thing is, what do you wish you'd learned earlier? And now, maybe this was a little about a bit obvious, but how would you answer those questions? <laughs> I knew this was coming, and I, I had like a split second to think about it, yet here I am. Um, I mean, the thing I like most really is just working with reporters on stories. A tough edit can weirdly be like almost as challenging as like a hard story to write. Like sometimes I'll read something and be like, this isn't where I want it to be, and I don't know how to get it there, and I'll like freak out and have to go for a walk. But ultimately, like being able to help shape a story and to work with a reporter is really rewarding. And I like really just personally enjoy the people I work with, which helps. Something I wish I'd learned earlier, I think what made me think of this was our conversation about J school and what you learn and what you don't. And I really wish that I had better understood how to be a good beat reporter and how to build relationships with people and how to write tough stories, you know, without making nobody ever want to call you back again. And I think most people feel their way to it, but I wish somebody had sat me down and given me some tips very early in my career instead of me having to figure it out over a period of six or seven years. Makes sense. Yeah. And now I will subject you to the most recent question I've solicited from somebody, which is, what's your most embarrassing journalism related story? Oh, Oh, it's probably not good that I can think of this one off the top of my head. Um, (laughs) So this gets very into the nitty gritty of how Congress works. But if you're voting on a bill in Congress, the first vote is on 
the rule for debate, how like debate on a bill will proceed. And usually the vote breaks down the same way the final vote does. But that happens about 24 hours before. And you can probably guess where this is going. I went through it and published the story that a bill had passed. When the bill had not passed, the rule had passed. The bill did eventually pass like a day or two later. But actually, this bill did it pass is quite a correction to have to append to a story about a bill passing. This was, I think, like 2012. Wow. And then what is your favorite film, book, TV, or other media property about journalists and why? Favorite would be tough. I've consumed a lot of media about journalism over the years. Probably the one that people don't know as well. I really like The Hour, the BBC's fictional TV series about the starting up of a news magazine in the 1950s. It's a really fun, well-acted show that's like, what if Mad Men was about journalism? And I have a tough spot in my heart for all the president's men. Yeah, I need to rewatch that one. It holds up. I rewatched it, I guess, right after the paper came out, I think. And I hadn't seen it since college, I think. And it's still pretty fun. And then the last question is, qualifications aside, if you couldn't be a journalist, what job would you do? So I don't have a great answer to this question, which is something that I probably should have as a 33-year-old in this industry who's gotten lucky for a decade. My dream alternate job is I would write accessible to the public historical nonfiction. Like I would be that person who writes about the entire history of, you know, salt or <laughs> just random everyday things. Like I, I have absolutely no qualifications for this job other than being a decent writer, but I think it would be really fun. I also had like a weird two day period where I was like, what if I got a PhD in economics? And what I learned is you need better undergrad grades than I had if you want to get a PhD in economics. <laughs> well, it's qualifications aside. So <laughs> yeah, it's true. Option. I mean, I report a lot on public policy research. I actually teach in a public policy master's program, which is hilarious because I am the least educated person in that room. And I have always thought, oh, it would be kind of neat to do the research that I write about. It's very in line with a lot of the values of journalism to me. Oh, yeah. I forgot you taught a class. I know I've seen it on social media or something. Are you still doing that or what's up with that now amid coronavirus? Yeah. So I had already taken this fall off because I just knew it was going to be insane. And the format I teach in is like two eight hour days that are often back to back. It's like a really long weekend seminar. And I was just like, I can't work 12 days straight when I'm already probably working 12 days straight. I am teaching again in January and I was really hoping it would be in person because I do not know how to adapt it for online, but it's looking like that's not going to happen and I'm going to have to learn how to adapt it for online. So that's a post-election problem for me. Wow. Yeah. Especially if it's the same format, like two like long sessions like that online can be tough as someone who just did a two week fellowship that involved long daily sessions of Zoom. Yeah. I mean, I can't do Zoom for more than an hour at a time. So this is going to be an interesting challenge for all of us. I'm going to have to sort of redo the format of the class, which is one reason I've been putting it off because I feel like I finally got to a format that I was like really happy with and now I have to throw it out. So you know, that's that's life. If that's the biggest pandemic problem I have, I'm doing pretty well. Right, right. I mean, at least at this point, January seems like an eternity away. Exactly. Anything could happen between now and then. Cool. And then, uh, yeah, I'm very happy with how the interview went. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? I don't think so. Thanks for the opportunity to do this. It was really fun. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. That's our show. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Libby Nelson, Senior Deputy Policy Editor at Vox. I'll post links to some of Libby's work and other things we talked about in the podcast description and also on our show page, foreignpod.podbean.com. If you like the show, please subscribe to it in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star rating. Beyond that, it would also be a huge help if you write out a positive review saying what you like about the show. It helps get the podcast more attention. Follow or tweet at me on Twitter at at ForeignPod. On Facebook, our page is facebook.com slash ForeignPod. Above all, if you know someone who might like the podcast, please recommend it to them. The show is produced and edited by me. Our music is a track called Love Chances by Makai Beats. There's more information on that in the podcast description and on our show page. Please look for the next episode to be posted on Sunday, November 1st. Until then, I'm Jake Spring, and this is Foreign Correspondence.